we were just doing integration, which we could write as the derivative of an unknown u being a given function and u being 0 at a. The solution is the integral of f. We now take a big generalization step and solve an ordinary differential equation, or ODE, where the f being integrated also depends on the unknown solution that we're trying to find. This is a first order ODE. There are also ODEs with higher order derivatives, and we'll return to them in a future section. We're also given an initial condition for the solution. Together, these two elements of an ODE and an initial condition are known as an initial value problem. The solution to an ODE is not unique, just like we have arbitrary additive constants for antiderivatives. Under fairly general circumstances, though, an IVP solution can be proved unique, as stated in Theorem 6.1.1. Hence, an IVP is an appropriate target for a numerical solution. Before we get to the numerical solutions, I want to point out the important class of linear ODEs, where du dt is a linear function of u. This does not mean that u is a linear function of t. Linear ODEs are one of the big classes of problems that can be solved by hand. The most important example of this type is u prime equals au for a constant a. The solution is just an exponential function e to the at, which you can easily check by plugging it in. One step up from this is what we call a variable coefficient problem. This is also solved by an exponential, provided that you can find an antiderivative of the coefficient function. There are some more solvable problems, including nonlinear ones, but most realistic problems, especially systems of two or more equations, require computational support. Here again is our first order initial value problem. We call the solution u the dependent variable, and t we call the independent variable. There are three things that we need in order to specify a particular ODE. They provide the data to the problem. First is this function f of t and u, which defines the ODE. Second is an interval for t, which defines the domain of the solution. And third is the initial value of the solution. The result of a numerical solution is a pair of vectors. We have t0, t1, t2, and so on up to tn, which are nodes in the t domain. And we also have u0, u1, and so on up to un. The value u sub i is meant to approximate the solution at time t sub i. We could use these outputs, as we did in the last chapter, to produce an interpolant if we want a function as the solution. Most software offers that option automatically. Sometimes it's called dense output. So here's an introduction to just the basics of solving 
initial value problems in MATLAB. Uh, here's a differential equation that I've specified with an interval for the solution and an initial value. The value of the independent variable here is zero, which is the beginning of the time interval. So to solve one of these in MATLAB, I need to provide those three ingredients. I need to provide this function here, the sine of u plus t squared. So that's a function of two variables, t and u, and they always have to be both given here and given in that order. I'm going to define a vector for the interval with the endpoints 0 and 4. And then I'm going to call one of MATLAB's solvers. There are many for different situations, but the one that you're most likely to turn to if you don't know anything in particular about, this, about the system is called ODE45. They all start with the letters ODE. So with ODE45, I have to give it that function f of two variables. I have to give it the time interval, and then I have to give it the initial value, which was specified as negative 1 up here. The output from this is two vectors of the same length. One of them is discrete values of the t variable. The other is discrete values of the solution at those times. And so that's what we get as the result. These t values are chosen automatically, and we'll get into that in some more detail later on. But suppose I didn't want these big gaps between the points. Suppose I wanted a lot of points to make a nice smooth plot, for example. What I can do is set up everything else the same way, except I will tell it, no, I want the solution to be at 500 points from 0 to 4 and then it will evaluate the solution at those points, essentially using interpolation internally. There's a third thing that we can do, which says, well, maybe I don't know the points in advance where I want to evaluate it. I just want to be able to evaluate it anywhere. In other words, I don't want vectors as the output. I want a function. So we can do that too. It's a little bit less direct, but you again create f the same way go back to specifying the time using just the endpoints. You call ODE45 with the same arguments, but now there's only one output. This output is a special kind of structure that MATLAB recognizes internally as representing all the data needed to solve the problem. And then I create a function u, which is a function of t only, and it calls this built-in thing called deval on the solution that it found. So now at this point, u is a callable function like anything else, and I can plot it or evaluate it wherever I want. Finally, let me discuss the conditioning of initial value problems. Remember that the data of a problem are the function f, the initial value, and the domain. It's easiest and most important to talk about what happens with respect to the initial value only. Let's define u of t and u0 to mean the solution of the initial value problem having initial data u0. To write that out, what we mean is that u at time a and value alpha equals alpha, by definition, and that the derivative of u with respect to the t argument is f of tu. A typical result is given in theorem 6.1.2. If we perturb the initial value by delta, and then subtract off the unperturbed solution, what we get is the change in the solution that results from the perturbation. This can be bounded above in norm by the magnitude of delta times the exponential of a constant L times B minus A. L is some upper bound of the partial derivative of the function f with respect to its u argument.
Now, the theorem says that the absolute condition number of the initial value problem is e to the l times b minus a. However, while this is always a valid upper bound, it can be wildly pessimistic. That is, the actual response to perturbation can be far smaller depending on what specific problem you have. Another thing to note is that the condition number grows exponentially with the length of the time domain. This is essentially what is meant by the butterfly effect, in which the effect of a tiny change can be magnified tremendously as time goes on. The upshot is that getting accurate results for solving IVPs on very long time intervals is no joke. I'm going to give you a quick example of what can go wrong when you're solving initial value problems. So here's a very simple looking problem, and let's say I want to solve it from 0 to 1, and the initial value is 1. So, as always, I define my function f that defines the differential equation. I'm not going to go all the way up to 1 right away. Let me start by going up to 1 half. And I'll call ODE 45 with f the time points, and the initial value, plot the result. So that looks pretty innocent. Let me go out a little bit further. Let me go from 0 to 0 0.6. Still looks fine. Maybe it's exponential growth. Let's go out to 0.7. Now, okay, the growth has taken off. It's, it's gotten over 10. Let's go out to 0.8. Well, suddenly I've gotten this message about a failure. Now when you see this particular failure, unable to meet integration tolerances without reducing the step size below the smallest value. That could mean there's a bug in your code. But in this case, that's not what's happening here. This is, if you like, it's sort of a bug in the IVP, or it's a, it's a feature of the IVP. So you'll notice that the solution, which was growing kind of slowly, suddenly took off and grew very quickly. In this problem, right, if it was just if the UDT is proportional to U, then you get exponential growth. Well, this is even faster than that, and in fact, it's so fast that the solution blows up in a finite amount of time. So it doesn't matter which solver we used; we would get a similar result where it says the solution may not exist past this time. So the existence of solutions to initial value problems is not something you can take for granted. Not every time when something goes wrong does it indicate that you did something wrong. It might just be a feature of the problem.